Earth would continue orbiting, we would know nothing would happen except it would be cold and dark and we would surely figure that out in a hurry. But gravity would otherwise not care whether we're orbiting a black hole at the distance we are. If we're close to the black hole, we would know very spooky things would be going on. Our space time would be warped enormously. But out at 1 AU, we would feel essentially no effects. Some, but very, very small. Gamma ray bursts, the birth of black holes. I've talked about them mainly because they're so luminous, even more luminous than supernovae. If you want to come away from this class knowing what the single most luminous things we can see in the universe, this is the answer. More so than quasars. For 10 seconds, one of these things outshines everything else in the universe. An enormous amount of energy. Beams, flashlights is the way that some of us think about them. You're able to look through back to the very early universe through the clouds of gas that have still not turned into galaxies, right? Because these stars, sorry, these, these GRBs come from very massive stars that we think are predominantly, or at least in large fraction, the stars that were in population three, that very first generation of stars. So that's exciting stuff. Then here we go. We get to the one of the towards the end of the key concepts, accretion power. You really all, I hope, now understand at least qualitatively why accretion, which we were really invoking back here, very much so. But accretion produces an enormous amount of energy if I'm able to let matter fall onto a very small object. <coughs> I should have put this in bold or a box around this. This is the key equation, this funny word m dot here, which we use many times. That's the rate at which matter is falling in times Newton's constant. We could even forget about this. We could always do scaling kinds of arguments. Those would be problems that you probably will have one of at least, another maybe more on the midterm, on the final. But basically the key dependence is on m over r. So accretion becomes very effective as a source of luminosity, L. If I either make m big and r small, or better yet if I do both. Okay, this number just goes shooting up through the roof. So a neutron star, the mass of the sun in the size of Boston. I mean, if it were, if that's what we were standing on, uh, the surface of, as I mentioned in that class, if I'm remembering right, you know, we would literally. Sorry to be graphic here. I hope I'm not going to gross anybody out, but we would be transformed into a mono layer of atoms. Right, the gravity would be so enormous. So this is something you can't comprehend or think about, but nature is perfectly happy with this. And so if I drop a marshmallow on a neutron star, it's equal in energy release to many thousands of times the energy of the atomic bomb in World War II. Just one little marshmallow on the surface of a neutron star. Okay, so. I know these numbers sound ridiculous, and they are, but, but if I do that continuously at some rate, I get a lot of luminosity out. And so we get to study that with these X-ray binaries, because we see lots of them all over the sky, from either neutron stars or black holes, and even accreting white dwarfs, which, which are much bigger, so R is much bigger, so L gets smaller. So if I take a white dwarf and throw stuff at it, it's bright. We give it a name. We call these things cataclysmic variables. I don't know if we ever use that term. So they're very bright, but they're not nearly as bright as if they make R a thousand times smaller than a white dwarf, which is what happens with a you know, the neutron star. So, okay. So, and that whole concept of accretion and it being a very luminous, uh, a very effective source of luminosity is what we're going to get to in one of the last things we'll be coming up on here, namely the entire galaxy. But first, we have to introduce the galaxy, which we, I think, rushed through more rapidly than I would have liked. But anyway, the galaxy that we live in is this big pinwheel, a big flat disk, a beautiful spiral structure that we spent literally 40 years trying to figure out. Because if you're inside a thin disk, it is not easy to realize that that's where you are, right? It took 
until the 1920s and 30s for this to finally be, the picture to become more or less clear. So spiral galaxies, I just mentioned, these giant molecular clouds are strung out in the thin disk. They don't exist at all, more than a few hundred parsecs above the galactic plane. They're just not there. Some of them are, so none of these statements are absolutely true. So all the stars are being formed by Mars in the thin disk. That's where all the black holes and neutron stars are being produced. But then they get, and this is part of the ongoing excitement, they get kicked up out of the plane. We don't really fully understand how that happens. Not, not from supernova explosions. This, the, the neutron stars, yes, but not the black holes. So there are all sorts of very exciting questions in what is really going on. At the center of this disk, this huge big disk, which is surrounded by a halo of huge mass of very old stars. Those are the population two stars. Low metallicity, very low metals. They were made from lower mass stars that didn't make metals. Metals are anything heavier than helium. It's a very expanded definition of metal. Anyway, at the center of this <coughs> thin disk and the roundish bulge in the middle is the galactic center, supermassive black hole. In the case of our galaxy, it is very soundly asleep. It's only accreting at a rate of about one one hundred millionth of what it would be doing if it were a quasar. So it's totally dormant. But believe it or not, we can see data from looking at actually some of these things, giant molecular clouds that are nearby that are hundreds and thousands of light years away, hundreds for the most part, and we can see some of them are bright on the surface facing the galactic center because they are glowing from a previous outburst of our galactic center. So there were times in, on the time scale of even a few hundreds to a few thousand years when this would have been totally invisible to, you know, to the Romans or whoever was you know, looking up at the sky 2,000 years ago. They never would have seen this because of the gas and dust in the way. But in high energy terms, it's interesting because things were happening in this last survival. But now it's very dormant, but very exciting to study. Okay, we have globular clusters as a key ingredient, very old fossils <coughs> from the very creation of the galaxy in this big extended halo. And outside <coughs> the halo of most of the stars, we get a region which is predominantly dark matter, which we don't understand, which we know out, out uh, paces, whatever the word is, is more dominant or more a, a larger, much larger fraction of what's exerting gravity in the universe is dark matter than is matter that we're used to. In fact, as we got to the very end, I'll mention it right now, Normal matter is only 5% of the universe. Dark matter is roughly 20%. So every gram of matter that we know about, there's five grams of dark matter out there somewhere. Five times as much. Likely to be discovered soon. In fact, we've been saying that for a decade, and it hasn't happened, but it's almost certainly a subatomic particle. Um, OK. Uh, Galaxies, we talked about this more than once, and it is a key idea that you should have in mind. The galaxies are big, fuzzy things, and they're relatively close together. Unlike stars, stars are teeny tiny things, even though we look at the sun, it looks huge. But the separation of the sun to Alpha Centauri is 200,000 AU, and the AU, astronomical unit, is the numbers right here. Uh, well, we can all do it the hard way or writing it down, 1.5 by 10 to the 8 kilometers, and the sun's radius is 700,000 kilometers, 7 by 10 to the 5. So it's roughly, the AU is, in, in most round numbers, 1,000 solar radii. So putting that together with the 200,000 AU to get to the closest star, the closest star is 200 million times farther away than the radius of the sun. So stars are teeny tiny things and they don't they, they, they never run into each other except in dense clusters. Or in binaries, which we didn't talk about this aspect of, remember half the stars in the sky are binaries? We've mentioned that many times. 
if you have binaries that are like Alberio, which is a not necessarily a binary, we all thought about that for even lab two or whatever it was, that's two. Um, but if I take a hugely widely separated binary, and Alberio is so far separated that it's probably not a bound binary, but it's just on the edge, but something much more reasonably, much closer together, then those do interact with each other because they're huge separated gravitating things. And so if somebody else comes along, you don't have to get close to the star, you're getting close to two stars. So binaries really are an important part of the story in understanding the whole workings of the galaxy. But anyway, um, galaxies, so this all began, we're talking about galaxies here, are very different, totally different story than stars. They're big, fluffy things that are relatively close together. So they're interacting all the time. And we are you know, doomed to fly with M31 in about, about less than 2 billion years. We see examples all over. I didn't show you some. I wish I had. Of uh, recent galaxy-galaxy collisions. All sorts of fireworks going on. Because the stars in them don't go smacking into each other. But the gas clouds, big waffly things, boy, they have no problem crashing into each other. They love it, right? They're just smacking head on. And they're compressing the gas in those already dense clouds even more. And what happens when you do that? What, what's your, what does your intuition tell you what happened? It's like the 4th of July. <laughs> bing, 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 bing. It's like, you know, like, like the fireworks going off. Because the massive stars, this is literally the way you should think about it. The massive stars are being produced at a much enhanced rate. The massive stars live the shortest. They produce supernovae. So if we look at one of these things, we see all these either, we don't see the supernovae going off before our eyes, but we see the remnants of them. And we see the clouds of heated up ionized gas, H2 region, which we probably haven't talked about much at all. We see the direct byproducts, supernova remnants, uh, that are produced by all these explosions having gone off. So we see very visible effects of gas clouds running into each other. I showed you an example of one galaxy, Centaurus A, the closest active galaxy to ours, which is a beautiful example of this, but there are others that are even more spectacular. Okay, we have galaxies that are like our own spirals, but the ones that have already run into others in some cases, many times. And so they're for the very oldest galaxies, largest chance to have had one or more major mergers, as we call them, are ellipticals. Very different galaxies, because all their gas has been stripped out of them. They've already turned them, their gas, their free gas into stars. So they're very old stars. And so forth. So we convert spirals into ellipticals in, uh, in galaxy collisions or encounters, and they, once again, are likely to encounter each other even when they're in groups, like us in our local group. Here we in Andromeda are encountering each other. But you wind up being in a galaxy, in a galaxy cluster with a thousand galaxies all swarming around, orbiting random orbits, not in a flat plane, three-dimensional space. Then this happens much more, and all sorts of things are going on. Okay, very quickly, get towards the Still got a few more pages of this, so I better speed up. Distance ladder, another something you should also be familiar with. Starting from the AU scale, going out to HR diagrams, and lab three, Cepheid variables. You should know what those are. Because you've got a well calibrated clock, think of it that way, how fast the star pulses. Think of it as the bell ringing, which I told you about a number of times that that uh, period is directly proportional to the luminosity. The longer the period, the time between maxima in its brightness, the more luminous the star is. The lower the tone of the bell, the more massive the bell is, okay? And supernova 1As, which are the <coughs> explosion of a white dwarf that is instantly being consumed by nuclear burning because it exceeded its Chandrasekhar mass, those are what got us out to measure the acceleration of the universe that we talked about in the last two classes, last class mainly. And those get out to 
very large systems with red chips of order 1.5, which used to sound large. Now it sounds rather close, but it's far enough that the universe is doing something very different, uh, namely accelerating than we have seen before. So the expansion of the universe came from Hubble using Cepheids as this distance indicator, velocity of apparent recession, which is not due to the galaxies all being kicked or something, it's due to expansion of the universe, meaning the universe is expanding faster and faster the farther back in time we look. Okay? V is equal to some constant, bubble is constant, times the distance. The larger away, <laughs> the farther away you are, the faster you appear to be moving because the universe is expanding that much faster as the farther back. Okay, uh, let's see what we... So then we got in the last week or two of the class to talking about very distant objects, how we can measure things that are very far away, not just because we want to measure the galaxies that have luminous black holes in them, which we call <coughs> quasars, <coughs> but because these things allow us to understand the structure of the universe on the biggest scales. So that's the underlying, the, the real motivation, which we didn't talk so much about. But so <coughs> the universe is expanding. We have this stretching of space, which is a hard idea to get in your head. But it's a concept you should have, this raisin cake analogy or expanding balloon that I mentioned. Um, everything gets farther away from everything else. There's no center to this. It's all of space expanding. That was clear more or less by the 1930s and by the 40s and 50s it was very clear. So <clears throat> this stretching of space means that the whole universe has a scale factor, as we call it, depending on the redshift, this Z, the delta lambda over lambda, how much the light has shifted. That's measuring the amount by which space and time have stretched as we go farther and farther away in distance and therefore farther and farther backwards in time. So because we see everything moving apart from everything at a faster uh, faster rate, the farther away we are, that means we had to have a beginning. There really was a beginning. There's no question about that. Up until the 50s, as I said, this was still debated. But the discovery of the microwave background made that absolutely clear that we had a big bang or something that began it all. And these quasars discovered only in the early 60s uh, Schmidt at Caltech made it possible to trace this in a way that we never knew was possible. The reason why even in 1962 when Martin Schmidt discovered these things, this was so mind-boggling by today's standards, a very modest redshift that this first quasar had, only 0.15, it's practically next door. But we had never seen any object at such a distance, even with a 200-inch telescope. So this was, and the reason we could see that one was because of this enormous power of accretion. That's why accretion is so important. Nature says, hey, if I got something for you, you want to see this monster black hole out at this enormous distance of 600 megaparsecs? I'll make it 12th magnitude. That's we should all now be somewhat familiar with how bright this is. In M39, which you all measured, that was not very much brighter. In fact, it's a bit brighter than where the where the sun would be in M39, roughly 13.5 or something. So instead of that being a <coughs> sun-like star, this very ordinary-looking star on the harbor plates, this thing was way, way, way far out, enormous. Uh, thousands of times more luminous than, well, millions of times more luminous than anything we've seen before, but thousands of times more luminous, even even a million times more luminous than most galaxies. We're not talking small numbers. This is really big stuff. The luminosity of, M of that quasar, which I don't think I did mention before, is, in fact, um, almost exactly one million times more luminous than our entire galaxy, everything in our galaxy all coming from that one black hole. So colossal amounts of energy. Okay, so, 
So then we get to the microwave background, discovered only in 65. It's an amazing discovery. It's, uh, we've talked about it quite a bit in the last couple of classes. And there we are with our you know, key concept number one in capital letters, black body radiation. There we're seeing the photosphere of the entire Big Bang. That's what we're looking at. We're looking back at it at an enormous redshift of 1100, which is when the universe was only 380,000 years old after the Big Bang. Had a radius of roughly that many light years, if you want to think of it in those physical terms. And we're looking at, and that was the radius at which, as space, this is all of space expanding, we look back at that radius and see not the radius itself, but we see the radiation that was emitted from that radius. Because like all black bodies, there is a region from which the radiation gets out that has a temperature and a radius, and a luminosity, in this case it's a luminosity of the entire universe. It's a bit hard to get your head around, but it was at that point in this uh, expansion scale factor when the temperature is only 3,000 degrees, which is when hydrogen atoms could first form. We could get electrons together with protons for the first time. And that made the universe transparent, or much more transparent, and so the light could get out and not be scattered by free electrons. And uh, so the radiation could break free, and we see it today, redshifted from 3,000 degrees down by this same factor, this 1,100, to 2.7 degrees. Coming absolutely to a part in 10,000, uniformly from every direction in the sky. But not quite uniformly, because there are ripples on the temperature, little teeny tiny hot points, those red versus blue points that we looked at a number of times in the last couple of classes, which allow us to uncover structure in the radiation and scales of fluctuations. Uh, these are actually sound waves, which we didn't talk about. Your, your reading gives you a nice description of this. I didn't go through this in class, but we're looking at acoustic peaks. There really are sound waves where it isn't sound that we would hear, but it's, it's modes of vibration of all the matter in the universe, which are producing those little speckles on that, on those beautiful maps of the radiation, because where the regions are less dense than others, they are cooler. Where they're more dense, so the other way around, where they're denser, they're hotter, and where they're denser, they're cooler, they're cooling faster. Anyway, there are variations in temperature that map the variations in density, which is what the, those ripples are fundamentally due to. Okay, so all of this CMB primarily, but also the large-scale structure coming from supernovae, supernova 1As once again, has allowed us to reach these amazing conclusions about the entire universe that we wound up with in our last class. And in understanding mainly the CMB, um, the fact that it's so uniform if I look over there versus over here, and those two parts of the universe have never been in causal contact. So something must have happened at the beginning of the Big Bang that happened at something that sounds impossible, but if you expand space, it is possible, not expanding an object in space, but the whole fabric of space and time appears to have ripped apart in this first 10 to the minus 34 seconds in this process called inflation. Alan Guth in MIT was the <laughs> prime inventor of that, He's still there. We thought a year ago, a year and a half ago, that the smoking gun of this process had been discovered by our own John Kovac in our department, but it was premature, it hasn't been discovered yet, but I think it will be soon, from a new kind of polarization signature on this microwave background, which would be a direct indicator that this really happened. But something like this must have happened to make the uniform as globally uniform as it is. Okay, uh, we are about done. And the, um, you know, the conclusions that you get to from stars are pretty, pretty amazing. You get all the way from the very beginning to understanding where all the elements come from understanding how you think about the whole universe. All these things, as I mentioned in the last class or two, it was literally the case, I remember this wasn't that long ago, in the 90s, I mean, you guys, so 
started to remember the 90s, almost a little bit, barely, whatever. Okay, in the 90s, cosmology was still being the butt of jokes among some astronomers. You guys have these wonderful theories, but you've got no data. Well, that was, of course, not true in the 90s. There was enormous data from the CMB. So it really is more like the 80s. I, sorry, scratch the 90s. The 80s, this was definitely the, the sort of very unfair thinking, but it was not without some reason. There was very little data. The CMB had been discovered, but all these subtle features of it had not been. Those were all in the 90s. So it's a very different universe that we understand now from all, all this, uh, but it is largely, not totally, coming from the stars. That's what, what we were trying to do in this class. Okay, so um, I gave you on the last slide of the last class some big questions, and I realized, just thinking about now, I never posted those revised notes. I'll put that up. It's good for you to come out of here with some record of what the really big questions are. There were, a couple, there were a couple of those last classes that I said I was going to repost, and I just realized I didn't, but I'll do it. So we haven't had um, more questions, but I was hoping that uh, there would be more on what, if anything, you wanted more feedback on. So anything else? Because I, I don't want to do, I've been doing all the talking, which is not, yes. So, yeah. Uh, I think it referenced uh, a section on continuum versus spectra. Um, yes. On right. Uh, right. Planetary nebula. Yep. Yep. And yep. And yep. What type of light light. Yep. Did you understand? I was trying to give you lots of clues, but should I be more explicit? Or what? What part of it did you find confusing, or want to know um, more about? I, I guess I, I didn't know. Um, okay. How you're making the distinction. Okay. Yeah. Here's what I was saying. I'll go back over it because it's a, it's a key idea. You've got half of the mass of the star because we've got a white dwarf left behind and the other half didn't just you know evaporate into space. It's all out there in that ring. Or, so at an enormous scale. So what I was asking that you think about is back to our definition when we first introduced black body radiation, that black body radiation arises from a very hot, at least, you know, also comes from cold objects like microwave background is very, very cold, 2.7 degrees, it's still black body radiation. But from a star, black body radiation comes from a very hot surface, the surface of our sun, and it has that remarkable form of this black body spectrum because it's coming from a dense and opaque object. So what I wanted you to think about is if I now take all the mass of what was in the star that, that not, didn't blow up. This is not a supernova. Remember. This is an AGB star expelling all of its mass to leave behind the little teeny tiny Earth-like size <coughs> core, the white dwarf. But all the rest of the mass has been ejected into space, and that's what you saw in the ring. So your intuition, I was hoping, would make it more reasonable that that is anything but opaque. And in fact, you can see it in your image. You can look through it. Right? It's not solid. You can see that it's lumpy. So that's what I wanted you to think about. And therefore, what kind of radiation is in this image. If the, for those, and I guess some of you guys could make three color images of it, right? There were a few people who did. No? no? Nobody here? I thought somebody, I thought somebody had actually done it. Why am I thinking that? I think you want to make one. Okay, well, you can all still do this. Anybody who wants to, you know, put up in their wall your own color image of the ring, will happily help you do it with the B, B and R images. But that uh, light in the ring, the question that you're meant to discuss in that part of, the, of your paper, if it's not coming from black body radiation and continuum, then it must be something else. And what your color image would show you, that would be the nice, and there's, a, of course, a beautiful color image in your textbooks. You've got, and if you Google ring nebula, and you'll see beautiful Hubble images of it or pieces of it, but um, what that light must be coming from is not continuum black body, but something else. The other major source of radiation we talked about. And the red color, in fact, is coming from hydrogen, H alpha, and a bit of nitrogen as well. The green is coming from oxygen. These are all bright emission lines. Okay, other questions? Anything? 
So just is going to slides or the slides from the classes or, or these slides? I mean, I, yeah, I think um, going through all of them is probably a bit much, but I, but go zip through them and pause on the blue font stuff. I tried to be consistent with those. And I think I've mentioned or just talked about a lot of them here, but I'm sure I've left some of them out. Some are more important than others. Um, the key ideas are, you know, we're not, tr we don't, this class we never intended to think that we're training you all to be astronomers. We would love to occasionally somebody says they want to do a secondary in our field, which is great. If anybody feels that way, come talk to us. We, we are we're getting lots more secondary concentrators. But the real thing for a class like this is to get some understanding of how we think about big questions like this and how, in this case, the role of observation and measurement and uncertainties, which we've spent a lot of time talking about, either allow you to learn something or tell you what, you know, what, we didn't talk about this part of the uncertainties very much, but clearly, or at least I hope it would be clear by now, that if your uncertainties are too large, you can't answer those questions. So in the, in the 80s, the microwave background was known to be isotropic, <coughs> same well, coming from over there, is up there versus here. And it was known already to a pretty respectable level, like parts in a few hundred. What turned out to be the case in 1998 <coughs> is when this discovery was first made. This was really big news. It was made not from a satellite, but from a balloon borne experiment launched over from Antarctica. The first indication of those acoustic peaks, the graininess of the background <coughs> was made. And then W map, the satellite, which I showed you the map, so really just nailed this down. But it was speckled, and those speckles gave you enormous information on the structure in the universe back at this very early time. The universe was only 400,000 years old. So, so anyway, so the point, just to finish, the, the reason why that's relevant to measurement is if your measurement accuracy isn't good enough, that whole understanding of how the universe is built just isn't possible to have. So it isn't a matter of just building bigger and bigger telescopes. It's getting better and better and more precise measurements, making those error bars smaller and smaller. Sorry, did I have a question? Oh, sorry, I think just like putting off what he asked. Yeah, yeah. If we want to be like really like serious, then if we want to know everything in this yes. 14 pages, is that enough or should we? Like check out the I would go through the slides briefly. I would flip through the textbook for things that the textbook is is relevant. Obviously, I didn't begin to talk about everything in the textbook, mm -hmm. and so as you can already see from the midterm or whatever, or looking at the old exam, most of the material that will be on things that we've talked about. But it's certainly possible that it will be something that is more reading related, but by and large it will come from what we talked about in class. And again, as I was just starting to say, it's the sort of the big the big picture ideas, not so much the nitty gritty details. Other questions? Um, anything? No? If not, then I know what I'm going to be doing all weekend long writing the exam, which I haven't done yet. And believe me, it's a, as you can see from the midterm, and I've done this many times, uh, it's tough to do, because that's why I had to you know, correct a few of the questions. I'm hoping I'll give it to the TFs to carefully tell me where I've got something wrong by the end of the weekend. But, but uh, anyway, it's, I will try, as I said at the very beginning today, I'll try to make it, I will make it shorter. The idea isn't to make this a three-hour, you know, marathon. But it will have lots of questions of the sort that we've talked about, as you might expect. Um, if people have any other questions, you know, you know who to ask, contact any of us about explicit things. So. But otherwise, I'll see you on Tuesday. All right, good. Oh, one more thing. So, yeah. so the because of the legal style paper, uh, yeah. the deadlines are starting to alter the 
Yeah, that that I I really intended that to be just for people who really do have exam hardships. If you have an exam, that's why I didn't I didn't say you have to have an exam on Monday or Tuesday. But if you really do have something that is uh, resembling that, then yes. If otherwise, it's in your best interest to get the evening lab paper in before the exam. But if you haven't turned it in, if you're not able to turn it in on Monday, then then you may as well wait till after. But we, we want to get started on grading. It's not a simple short job. Yeah, so I was wondering for the exam itself. I guess yeah. that makes sense. Would it include questions that you would ask about the final, final paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I haven't thought about that. But, I, but in general, everything in that final paper is nothing new that isn't in the things we've talked about here. So, yeah. But you should be familiar with those questions. Yes. Yeah. So, you, so is this your little 